I guess this weather is why I moved to Havasu. How many snowbirds are here? Man, it is amazing. I understand why you are here in Lake Havasu. Uh, it is so good, so good. Today we are continuing our sermon series, The Moral of the Story. And I hope that you really enjoyed taking the stories of Jesus and applying them to your life. We all want to experience life change. And we are fully convinced that one of the ways that we experience life change best is by applying God's word to our life. If we want to be more like Jesus, we apply his word to our life. And just as a reminder, we are one church with three locations. We have one campus in Parker, uh, one campus at Sweetwater, and one campus on McCulloch. We also have ways that people can watch online, and they're able to look at the, the sermons and watch the sermons from past. So those of you watching us online, thank you. We're glad that you're here with us. And also, those of you who are worshiping with us at McCulloch right now, man, we are excited about what God is doing there. Continue to invite friends and family to worship God with you at the McCulloch campus. Today we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 21. It's on page 982 in the Pew Bible underneath your seat. Or I said the Pew Bible. Yeah. You know, I never knew why they called those things pews anyway. If you can help me with that at some point, that would be great. Uh, located underneath the seat in front of you, there's a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we want to encourage you to take that Bible, use that Bible, read that Bible, and apply it to your life, and you will experience life change you know, that's exactly what Jesus wanted his followers to experience. When he came to this earth and he walked among us and he healed the sick and he taught and, and he loved people, he wanted those people to begin to live like him. That's what it meant to be a disciple. He wanted his followers to begin to emulate and reflect his character and to love other people the way that he loved them. He knew that Jesus, uh, Jesus knew that if people applied his teachings to their lives, they would experience just a little bit of what it's like in heaven on this earth. You know, and at Calvary, we're convinced that the more we apply the teachings of Jesus to our lives, the more we experience what heaven will be like. Now think about that. See, the, the more we apply God's teaching, God's word to our life, the more we experience what heaven is going to be like. See, in heaven, we will not have sin. Isn't that a good thing? In heaven, we will not even have the desire to sin. Uh, we will have not to have to wrestle with lying or being lied to. Uh, no lust, no gossip, no fighting, no bickering, no arguing with your wife about what to watch on television. I mean, that we're not going to experience any negativity in heaven whatsoever. Wouldn't you like to experience a little bit of heaven then on this earth? Right? Wouldn't you like to experience what it means to follow Jesus and that other people are loving Jesus uh, the way that we ought to? But we can't, can we? We can't fully experience what it's like because, the power, because of the power of sin in our lives. And even if you could live your life perfectly, your spouse is going to ruin it for you. <laughs> your boss is going to ruin it for you. Everyone around you is still going to be a scum-sucking pig sinner, even if you were perfect, Right? Now, I want you to think about how, other, how much other people around you influence you. I want you to be honest, okay, if you would. Raise your hand if you've ever been in a good mood, but your spouse ruined it. <laughs> All the men are like... <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever been in a good mood and your boss ruined your day. Okay, raise your hand if you've ever been in a good mood, but your children ruined it by being disobedient. Okay, bloody sinning kids running around, breaking things. You know, life would be so stress-free, right, if our parents were always obedient all the time, wouldn't it? Now, this is not a parenting sermon, by the way, uh, but just imagine if life was like when you were raising your kids or even now, if you ask them to wash the dishes and they do it without saying no. Or keep your, you know, tell them to keep their clothes off the floor and they do it and their, their floor is clean. Or you tell them not to touch the dog in the circle spot underneath his tail and they listen, <laughs> right? And they're obedient. They, their fingers are clean. Or when you tell them to wash their hands after touching the dog there and they actually do it. They go and they wash their hands. Right? But our children aren't perfect, are they? And neither am I. And neither are you. 
Uh, neither is your spouse. We, we really, we throw that word around all the time about people being perfect. Oh, she's perfect. Oh, he's perfect. My kids are perfect. And they're really not. Jesus shared a story in Matthew 21 about two kids that gave their dad a hard time. Um, this is a sermon about you and me. Let's read in Matthew chapter 21. Jesus said, what do you think? A man had two sons and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, well, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Now, the first question I have for you is obvious. Uh, if you were the dad in the story, which of the kids would you not spank, right? The first son says, hey, I'm going to go, and he didn't go. But, and the second son said, uh, I'm not going to go, and he went. As a parent, the blatant defiance of the first son makes us all cringe a little bit. Have you ever been in public and told your child to do something, and they say no, right? I mean, it makes you cringe because you know your kids aren't that bad, but in this moment, they're going to be defiant. We've all been in public with our perfect kids at some point, and they tell us no, uh, sometimes my children tell me yes, and then they don't do it. Uh, sometimes my children will say, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's that dust circulating around. <coughs> I didn't move to have a suit for this. <coughs> sometimes my children tell me yes, but they don't do it. It's like uh, I go into their, they, they go into their room to clean their room after we tell them to, and I walk in an hour later, and they're sitting on the floor playing with their Barbies. Or they're reading books. Why didn't you clean? Oh, I forgot, right? They don't do what you ask them to do, and rarely do they tell me no and then do it, right? Hey, girls, I want you to clean their room. Rarely have they ever said, I will not, sir, and then they walk into the room and clean, unless all of them tell me no, and I finish spanking the first one, and now all three, the rest of them run into the room and start cleaning, right? But that takes us to the moral of a story, which is pretending to be obedient is not obedience. Pretending to be obedient is not obedience. We've all heard the expression before, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It's the same thing for us as followers of Jesus. Pretending to be obedient is not what God is looking for in people who say that they are his followers. Now think about that word, the followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus insinuate that we are actually following. We're doing what he calls us to do. If you're a follower of Jesus and you surrendered your life to Christ and you've had a moment where you received him as your Lord and Savior, you've been born again, you've been changed into a different person, God has changed even the very way you think, yet sometimes followers of Jesus merely pretend to be obedient. For instance, Back years ago, there were churches that actually had pews and they had offering plates and they would pass those offering plates up and down the aisle. Not here. This has never happened here, by the way, what I'm about to tell you. But do you know that individuals who end up counting that money on church staff or maybe it's a volunteer or a finance committee, almost weekly in churches across America, they're pulling out empty envelopes. Because people want to give the impression that they're being obedient and giving. They want to give the impression that they're being generous and they're just dropping an empty envelope in the plate. I want to confess something to you. I have been guilty of that. Now, I've been a guest pastor before, a guest preacher before, and, and been preaching and sharing the gospel and sit down at the end, and they passed the plate, and I felt like all the eyes in the crowd were on me to see if the pastor was going to give. 
So I reached over and I got an envelope, wrote Christie's name on it and dropped it in the plate. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think that followers of Jesus do struggle with pretending to follow Jesus and not really following him. You know, for instance, just a question. Today when you were worshiping, when you were worshiping God, you were singing songs, you were standing up, were you pretending to worship? Were you singing a song, but were you thinking about everything else that you had going on in your life? See, I think that followers of Jesus, we often pretend to be obedient but we aren't really obedient. Maybe we don't always serve wholeheartedly. Sometimes we serve, but we do it and we're complaining about it. That's pretending to be obedient. See, I, I don't want to be a person who pretends to live out my faith uh, more than I, more, I, I just, I don't want that. I don't want to have the act of being obedient as much as I want my heart to be obedient when it comes to following Jesus. As an aside, I was so impressed with the number of people that went back to sponsor a Compassion Kid last week. I mean, there were so many people that heard that call of generosity, that call to be generous, that call to be compassionate to others. And they went back and they grabbed an envelope. And some of you felt that, that sense, that, that yes, that you said, yes, God, I want to sponsor a kid. And when you walked back, maybe the table was too full. Maybe there were too many people here or, or there. I want to encourage you, we still have kids, go grab one. Not grab a kid. <laughs> Leave those kids alone in the nursery, in the preschool, in this side. But, but get a compassion kid. If you sensed in your heart that God was leading you to say yes, and you said yes, then go do it, right? Go do it. I want to encourage you to do that. What about serving in some capacity at Calvary? Um, did you say yes at first, but then you backed out because you didn't like the rotation system? Uh, you said yes to serve, but then you said, hey, you know what, I've got other things to do. We just need to make sure, especially as followers of Jesus, that we understand that pretending to follow Jesus is not real obedience. And you might say, well, pastor, I think that's hard on us. I, we're not pretending. Yeah, I feel like I've pretended before. I feel like I've pretended to be spiritual when I shouldn't have. And I've asked God to forgive me for that. And I think that if I do it as a pastor, I think it's certainly a temptation for church family to do it as well. So let's look at the individual sons, if we could. The first son illustrates repentance. He said no, right? He's the son that really makes you angry in this verse, right? In this passage, he said, no, I'm not going to do it. But then he changed his mind. Do you know that the definition for repentance is actually a U-turn? It's actually changing directions. It's reversing your course and going a different way. He was living life for himself. He was living in disobedience and he stopped. He realized he was wrong to tell his father no and he repented. He changed his mind. He made a U-turn. His no changed into a yes. See, I think some of us in this room today are stuck in no. We're stuck in the, the word no. Somebody asks us to serve, no. God speaks to you and tells you to, to love on somebody in your neighborhood, love on somebody in your community, speak to them, encourage them, and we're stuck in no. Are you stuck in disobedience to God? Do you know the Spirit of God is leading you to do something, but you're refusing to do it? As a follower of Jesus, our whole relationship began with the word yes. Our whole relationship began with the word yes, Say yes, Jesus, I understand that I'm a sinner. Yes, I need you in my life. Yes, I understand that you died on the cross for my sins. Yes, I receive you as my Savior and Lord. And if our life with Jesus begins, uh, began with yes, then our actions as followers of Jesus ought to continue in yes. We started off strong, loving others, check. Bible reading and prayer, check. Telling others about Jesus, check. Serving in the church to help others, check. Praying, check. Generous with our junk, check. 
But then that drift into disobedience began. Your, maybe your relationship with God became less and less of a priority for you. Maybe you continued to attend church, pretend church, pretend worship because you enjoyed the people in your life group so much. Or maybe you continued to uh, be involved in life group, but you started shutting off and not speaking and not being vulnerable and not being transparent with them. And internally you drifted further and further and further away from God. Maybe you've drifted so far away, now you feel like a fake. Maybe you've drifted so far away from that, per and that personal relationship with God, you just feel like you're pretending. You feel like a fake. You feel like, man, if other people knew the real me, they would certainly say that I am not a follower of Jesus. And maybe you no longer think of yourself as a follower of Jesus. Maybe you feel like you're just one of the crowd watching other people experience life change. You're stuck in a no. And to get unstuck, all you have to do is begin to say yes to the Lord. All you have to do is change your mind. And here's the beautiful thing about God. He will always let you say yes. He will always let you change your mind. He will always let you experience his kindness and his mercy and his presence. Romans 2, 4, the apostle Paul said, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does it, this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from sin? See, in spite of being stuck in no, God continues to be kind to you. God continues to bless you. God continues to provide for you. God continues to provide you with great people to worship with and great uh, family members. God continues to bless you financially and take care of you as his child. He continues to show that kindness to you. He loves you. And he's ready for you to step out of that no lifestyle. You feel harnessed. You feel stuck. It's a lie. You feel trapped by your past. It's a lie. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, the apostle Paul wrote again. He said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. It's time for followers of Jesus to put away the no, right? And start walking in obedience. You know, I, I, every time I think about somebody saying no, I always go back to my children stomping their feet, holding their breath and doing something like that and just saying the word no. Yet I know I've been like that before to God, my heavenly father. You see that person on the sidewalk? Go buy them something to eat and give it to them. No. You see that person that knocked on your door? Go talk to them about Jesus. No. God desires that I start living by his spirit and start following him, saying yes to him, because then the power of God is going to work through me. And when you begin to say yes more and more, the power of God is going to work through you. Put away that no. Say yes to daily Bible reading and prayer. Say yes to serving on a mission trip. Say yes to sponsor a compassion kid. Say yes to loving other people with your family. While it is still called today, say yes. And that takes us to the second son. The second son illustrates rejection. See, the second son lied about doing what his father asked him to do. Now, I must confess, I don't mind my children disobeying me as much as it bothers me when they lie to me. You know, it's when my daughters lie to me, it just gets underneath my skin right? It bothers me. Raise your hand if it really bothers you when your child or children have lied to you or lied to you in the past. It, it bothers us because they're being deceptive. It takes sin to a whole nother level when somebody lies to you that it's, they don't want to just admit that what they did was wrong, but now they want to admit that they never did it in the first place. They lie and they're deceptive. See, the first son represents all those who attend and have no relationship with God whatsoever. The first son represents all those people who go to church, 
read their Bible, serve, give generously, but have no relationship with God whatsoever. God does not want you to serve. God doesn't want you to give if you don't have a relationship with him. They enjoy that people know they're going to church. They like people to know that they're being generous and helping others. They like for people to believe a lie. Let me ask you, have you rejected a personal relationship with God before? Have you heard God calling you, God speaking to you, God reminding you that he gave his son for you to live and you've stubbornly said no? See, I, I love to joke around and I love to laugh and I love to have fun, whether it's speaking and preaching or whether it's in a, an office or wherever it is. I enjoy that. It's fun. But when it comes to the gospel, it's not really a laughing matter because what Jesus taught about salvation and heaven, he also taught about eternal punishment and hell. See, to reject God's grace in our lives here on this earth has eternal consequences. I don't like to talk about hell, but it is what awaits those who have rejected grace. That's a reality. Now, I don't like to talk about it. I don't like to think about it. I don't like to read about it. I have family members that have died rejecting faith in Jesus. And I don't like to think about hell because I, don't, I get uncomfortable thinking about what they experience. Jesus described hell in a few verses. He described it as eternal torment in Mark 9, 48. He said, talking about hell, where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. That doesn't sound good. Weeping and brokenness day after day. Matthew 25, 30, he described hell when he said, Now throw this useless servant out into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, those in hell will experience anguish and weeping because of the torment and the pain and the punishment. It's going to hurt. It's an eternal flame that never kills anything. It's designed to torture those in hell will weep because of the hopelessness of knowing that there is no escaping for all eternity. They weep because they gave up on grace. They rejected grace. And now they have no hope of ever being changed by the gospel. I hate hell and I hate talking about hell. Yet it's a reality for those that refuse to obey God's call of salvation. Those individuals reject mercy. They reject having their sins forgiven. They reject God's love. And so let me ask you a question. Which son are you today? Which son are you today? And which son do you want to be? Are you the first son? Have you experienced life change by trusting in Jesus? Do you practice repentance in your life on a regular basis? Uh, are you the second son that understands the truth of grace, understands that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin on the cross so that you can have a relationship with God through Christ and continue to reject it? Are you that son? See, you're the only one that can speak to that. I don't know your heart. Heck, you don't know my heart. Your spouse doesn't know your heart. You're the only one that can say whether or not you've truly given your life to Jesus and asked him to be your savior. If you realize today that you're that second son, but want to be the first son and have eternal life and experience a relationship with God, I want to encourage you, if you would allow me the opportunity to give you the right words to say in just a second. Now, I can't give you the faith, but if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that you are that scum-sucking pig sinner in need of Jesus... If you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead three days later and is one day going to return, if you believe that, then God is giving you that faith to believe that. 
All I want to do then is help you to put that faith in words so that you can know that you know that you know that you are a child of God and that you've received Jesus as your Savior. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. By making Jesus the Lord of your life, you receive forgiveness for your sins and become a follower of Jesus. And if that's what you want, I want to encourage you now to bow your head across the room. If you believe what I've already said, if you believe what I've already stated about Jesus, then just let me help you find the right words to say to God so that when you leave this place today, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt your sins are forgiven, you've been born again, and you've been made new. Let's pray together. God, I believe you sent Jesus, your son, to pay the penalty for my sin on the cross. If you believe that, you just say that back to God. You can say it out loud. You can say it quietly. God, I believe that he died and he rose from the dead and will one day return. I confess I'm a sinner and I receive the gift of forgiveness. Thank you. And now I commit to become a faithful follower of Jesus. Thank you for the second chance I have to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just gave your life to Jesus, if you just surrendered your life to Jesus for the first time, if you just became that first son and you practice repentance for the first time, you, you're born again and you've been made new, that is incredible. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Tell somebody, tell your spouse, tell your children, tell your, tell your family, tell your friends, tell your parents, tell somebody. And if you don't have anybody that you, you can tell, reach over into the seat back in front of you, grab a connect card, write your name and information on there and tell us, I just gave my life to Jesus. We want to celebrate with you and talk with you. And maybe you don't want to do it that way. Maybe you want to come to the front of the altar here in just a moment as we, as our band uh, wraps us up after worship, after that closing song, and come down front and talk to one of our prayer ministry and tell them, I just gave my life to Jesus. I, I didn't want to be that, that second son anymore. I, I didn't want to live my life in disobedience. I didn't want to pretend anymore. I wanted to be real. I wanted to give my life to Jesus, and I did. If that's you, I want to encourage you talk to our prayer ministry at the close of our service and let them know what God just did in your life. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for this parable that we get to read about two sons and help us all, Father, to be like that first son that said no and then went. What a beautiful picture of conversion Help us to continue to practice that every day in our lives as we seek to follow you and please you. In Jesus' name.